Biophysics applies the theories and methods of physics to understanding how biological systems work. Biophysics is essential in looking at how the molecules of life are made, how cells move, and how the complex systems in our bodies function. Understanding how all life works requires experts from a wide variety of fields, and it takes a vibrant, interdisciplinary community to make that happen. Now, in San Diego, California, scientists from all over the world are coming together to share, learn, and discuss the very latest in biophysics. This is the 2020 Biophysical Society Annual Meeting, and we're Biophysical Society TV. Great to be back for one more day here at the San Diego Convention Center. This week home to physicists, chemists, material scientists, pharmacologists, and so many more for the Biophysical Society annual meeting. And as we gear up for our last show here in sunny Southern California, let's take a look at what's in store. This kind of information cannot be obtained in other way today unless you use this technology. I really like Biophysics Week just because of the outreach that it really brings to people who may have never even heard of the field before, who really become excited when you just show them really cool science. You know, image is everything, right? Um, and we have beautiful, beautiful images of life. I was just in a session about single molecules. You can see single little proteins doing their jobs, you know, individual proteins. I come here every year. I've been coming for 12 years now, and it's my favorite meeting by far that I've gone to. That's awesome. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. All right. Biophysicists are able to make incredible images at a multitude of scales, doing so to get a better understanding of how our molecules function. And to walk us through that process, I'm joined by Professor Dorit Hanane. Thank you so much for joining us. The first question is about your imaging and what, what imaging you're focused on. Uh, what unique insights does this technique allow us to gain? So the type of imaging that I use is uh, imaging that combine light microscopy imaging, live microscopy imaging, with high resolution electron microscopy. It's also have an acronym of like cryoclam, which is the correlative light and electron microscopy. This combination of both techniques allow us to identify cells and look at molecules in cells in a functional state and then decipher the state, the structural state at high resolution, like single filament resolution at the nanometer scale. How important is it to be viewing these molecules in vivo or as close to their natural condition as possible? And how are you able to do this? So the importance, I would say, can be divided into two stages. The first thing is uh, something that cryoclam can do and no other technologies, imaging or structural technologies can do, is can look at those macromolecular in function in the context of the cellular environment. Our cells has about 10,000 different molecules and what they interact with each other, when they talk with each other, this is actually what the cells do. So to able to look at molecules in the context is the primary goal and the primary advantage of this technology. And you have brought some of these images with you. Yes. What are we looking at here? And so in here particularly, what you are looking at, the range of scales for your first question is, we can look at tens of microns to single nanometer scale. So nanometer is about 10 to the minus nine of a meter. So we can here in this one image, in the color coded that you can see, we are talking about tens of, uh, tens of microns. And when you look at in the lower part of the panel, you're looking at the nanometer scale. So what we're doing in here in this uh, image is we are trying to coordinate a functional state of a molecule. Here is a biosensor and we're looking at its activity state in the live microscopy when the cell is alive. And then we plunge, freeze it, arrest the cell, and we then look at those small areas that you have marked here in the rectangles and we can image it with an electron microscope with a technology known as in situ cellular tomography. And we can look at those filaments at the resolution that you see in these two bottoms. The red ones are the high activity of that sensor. The purple one is the low activity of that sensor. 
How does this let you correlate or couple the information you're gathering at different scales? Uh, what example do you have of the kinds of things this can tell us? So, for example, something that in, in this particular study we're able to identify is we're able to identify how an activity of a sensor manipulate or signal to the cell to generate different cytoskeleton arrangement. So this is a, a technology that allows us to look at the formation of this high stack of actin filaments represented here by the, by the lines in here and showing they are poorly aligned they are very unique in density, whereas in the absence of the activation of that sensor, the filaments are very long, very, very aligned with respect to a particular direction. This kind of information cannot be obtained in other way today unless you use this technology. These images. Incredible. You'll be presenting this work at the new and notable symposium on Wednesday. What's the title of your talk and why should people come to hear you speak? Well, the title of the talk is Coupling Molecular Activation and Function in order to using uh, several different imaging technologies. And why to come to this uh, is I, here I just gave you a snapshot of a little bit of what we, can, we are going to present. And the information and the breadth of details will be more provided in the lecture. So I hope people find it intriguing enough to come and join. Well, we want to go in depth with you. So thank you for now for giving us a preview, Dr. Dorit Hanin. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. Thank you. NADA and other group using state-of-the-art technology to make observations about biophysical processes. It's the Shenandoah Valley Regional NMR facility at James Madison University. The mission of the facility is to provide adequate resources for uh, education and training students, make sure they have the equipment for their research needs. Now we have three magnets. The 600 is mainly for bio users, and the 300 and 400 is mainly for educational and training purposes and for organic chemists. This is the only center I know of that sort of is in that the temperate intermediate zone. There's good facilities to do really high quality work, um, but we also are training students at the same time. The DEF program is so unique because of the access it provides to the equipment here, especially the NMR machines. And also it provides interpreting services on the spot. <laughs> Everything here, they just provide so much support. I can't imagine if it were gone I mean, because it really keeps me motivated for my research. This center is unique in that it's free. You, uh, all the, the air, uh, area users can just you know, sign up and come here. So not only are they allowed to use the facilities for free, but they also get some other opinions outside of their relatively small group of faculty that they're working with. The uh, research that I do here at this facility not only benefits um, my and my students' research, but it also benefits my colleagues at Bridgewater's research as well. One of the nice things about my being able to have my students get checked out on these instruments and use them is that my research students are by and large going to graduate or professional schools. And um, while at Bridgewater they are able to run room temperature NMRs um, routinely, um, it is very nice for them to be able to come here and to be able to run an instrument that is very much like the instruments that they will run either in industry or in graduate school. The JMU program has been a great experience and I would love to recruit more deaf and hard of hearing students because often those students don't have the same opportunities to advance in science. I've been able to learn a variety of lab skills and use special equipment at JMU like the NMR. It's very rare for undergraduates to get hands-on experience with a lot of biophysical techniques. I specifically have been able to get really hands-on experience with 2D NMR on proteins. I've been able to travel to Argonne National Lab and use their advanced photon source to collect small angle X-ray scattering. And then also here at JMU, we have access to LCMS, UBVIS, CD, uh, and also ITC. Anyone who is on the fence about applying to an REU program, I would totally recommend just going for it. It's an insane opportunity, and I would recommend anyone to do that. It's pretty rare to see nationwide that the AMR facility will offer 
free access to all users. MR is usually quite sophisticated and to manage a large number of outside users can be difficult. But for us, we welcome new users and that way we bring all the community users together and we together discuss about their research leads and what type of experiment they can do. And we also discuss about the parameter they use and post post grant. It's a good way to bring the whole community together. We are interested in biofilm formation. To study bacterial adhesion, we use modern surface science techniques such as photoelectron spectroscopy or atomic force microscopy. Our center research focuses on the macromolecules and machines of life. This goes from nanoscale assemblies all the way to cells and how they organize to form a colonies and differentiating tissue. For us, we welcome new users and that way we bring all the community users together and we together discuss about their research leads. As scientists, we have to make knowledge available to the broader scientific community. This is really at the core of what university research is supposed to do. Now for our final rundown with the 2020 co-chairs, let's see what's not to miss on Tuesday and Wednesday of the annual meeting. For Tuesday, one of the sessions I'm very excited about is neuron glia interactions. And you know, as biophysicists, all of us are excited about studying the neuron, but there are supporting tissues in cells called glia uh, that actually are, are intimately involved in electrical excitability. And we have a whole session dedicated to looking at these astrocytes and microglia and how they support the, the thinking brain. And also on Tuesday is the workshop sessions. The Tuesday evening workshops are really devoted to tool development. Two of the workshops that I'm excited about are the simulation strategies for large scales. So as computers get more powerful and our interest in more complex systems grows increasingly, we need to develop computational strategies to be able to monitor and modulate and observe these larger, more complex systems. The second workshop I'd like to focus on on Tuesday is the quantitative biosensors. So one of the real issues about biophysics moving increasingly more in vivo is we just don't have the tools available to be able to monitor the individual biomolecules that we'd like to track in the cell. The one Tuesday night workshop that I'm looking forward to is chemical biology tools for biophysicists. And this is really exciting to me as an organic chemist because we're going to have five speakers that are going to come and talk about how they can use organic chemistry and other chemical approaches to study single molecule biophysics uh, as well as cellular biophysical properties. The challenge is going to be picking which of the workshops to attend because they are all happening simultaneously on Tuesday evening. So the last day of the meeting on Wednesday, I want to highlight one session in particular, and that's shape-shifting proteins. The field of protein structure has grown up thinking about protein sequences, each having one unique structure, but in reality, some proteins, we don't actually really even know how many proteins can populate more than one really radically different structures. And in many cases, in all cases discovered so far, those really distinct conformations are important for that protein's function. The last session we wanted to highlight on Wednesday is the new and noticeable session. Because the planning for the overall annual meeting starts two years in advance, but obviously scientific discoveries are happening all the time. So the new and notable session provides an opportunity to highlight more recent discoveries um, and emerging topics. Yeah, it's going to be a great session. We hope to see you there at the new and notable one. Now to go beyond the annual meeting. Every year, Biophysics Week aims to raise awareness of this important and exciting field among students and the public around the world. With 2020 set to be one of the best ones yet, let's hear what to expect. Biophysics Week is a time when we get to celebrate and raise awareness about biophysics. It's this year, it's March 23rd through 27th. Biophysics Week is a week in late March each year uh, where we ask members of the society to kind of reach out beyond their own circles. It's for biophysicists who are members of the society to celebrate biophysics and what it means to be a biophysicist. We celebrate biophysics worldwide by hosting events at our institutions. 
where we mix high school students with undergraduates, graduate students, postdocs, faculty. Biophysics Week is important to me because it really focuses a lot on outreach to people who may not understand necessarily what biophysics is and what the community is really striving for and our goals. We use Biophysics Week to advertise to the general population. We talk to high schools, we talk to middle schools about what biophysics is and what they can get interested in that is biophysics. Well, at Clemson University for Biophysics Week, we always bring in an outside speaker from a different university who comes and gives a presentation for one of our seminars. So we'll bring in high school students, middle school students, we'll let them use our virtual reality headsets to see what it's like to walk inside a cell. We will actually be performing a kids' fair. We can actually bring ideas from biophysics to these elementary schoolers and middle schoolers who really become excited when you just show them really cool science. It's a time for us to interact with our local legislators and really make them aware of biophysics, the impact of biophysics, the impact of federal funding coming to the Atlanta area for the major universities there, how it supports not only science but the economy. I really like Biophysics Week just because of the outreach that it really brings to people who may have never even heard of the field before. I know when I came to university I had no idea what biophysics is, but now I can't imagine my life without it. It's just sort of heartwarming to know that the members care enough about this topic to organize these events. The, the most important thing is to find a small group of students who are enthusiastic about sharing their love for biophysics with, uh, with a community and their enthusiasm is what will carry the day. The easiest way to get people involved in Biophysics Week, I've learned, is to talk to people, word of mouth. So you want to come out with an event, a lot of free food, something that's fun. This is a really prime opportunity to get a large amount of people involved in our research. Um, and really that provides better access to what we do, what we study, and gives the public a really better knowledge and a better grip on our field as a whole. That the average American, though paying for it, hasn't heard very much about it, doesn't understand that relationship. And as scientists, they're public servants, and we all have a responsibility. Everybody who wants to should get involved in Biophysics Week because biophysics is the thing that we all do and we all love. Uh, and to raise awareness out there in the larger community why that's important. So great to see so much activity around Biophysics Week this year. Put it in the diary and don't forget. Now, from inspiring the next generation to what inspired you, let's talk to you guys one more time. So, Amea, why choose biophysics? I think as biologists, we really care about uh, the diversity of biological forms, how animals are different from each other, how they do all the wonderful things they do. But really, the most interesting questions are physical questions, how quickly things happen, where they happen in, uh, in the cell or in the body. Uh, and I think biophysics really gives us the tools to ask and then answer those questions. So. And Lena, why choose biophysics? Mm, because we mm, use both physics and biology for cancer application. And we try to understand how oncogene induction can change the, uh, the um, basic mechanisms in the cell. And we can use the biology I knew and I, I can couple it with the, the my optical microscopy techniques I'm learning. So I'm, I'm really happy about my project at the moment. What makes this such an exciting area to be in? Yeah, because in the biophysics, we have um, like a lot of uh, exciting research. One thing that I'm currently doing on the protein detection of those things in, in my lab. So we can detect single biological entity that is really important to study because if the structure and function of single biological entity changes, that will change or that have a tremendous impact on the single cellular level that ultimately leads to various different kind of diseases, including cancers. Oh, you know, I think the community, specifically the Biophysical Society meeting, is a big part of why we're here. Um, the poster sessions are so friendly, you make connections, um, you build on the work you've done. It isn't purely confrontational. 
Um, I think that's why I like this community and that's why I love bringing students into this community and it's wonderful to see, to, to hear them be so excited about it. What makes this such an exciting place to be? Oh, no, absolutely. Getting to talk to everybody and seeing all of the innovations that come about whenever you mix these different backgrounds and different groups. Um, it makes it one of my favorite places to be this time of year. Like, I come here every year. I've been coming for 12 years now and it's wow. my favorite meeting by far that I've gone to. That's awesome. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. All right. As we come to the end of the meeting, it's time to start looking ahead to the coming year in biophysics. And to do so, I'm joined by incoming president, Dr. Catherine Royer. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah. First question, what led you to this role? And what was your motivation? I've been a member of the Biophysical Society since 1982, when uh, my thesis advisor took me to the Biophysical Society meeting in San Antonio. And uh, I was hooked from that point on. Uh, I, I've been to every meeting, I think, uh, since except for the years that I had children. How? <laughs> so, uh, a stalwart member of the society. Uh, I've been uh, involved in the committees, I've been involved in um, uh, council before, and uh, when I was asked to run for president, I just felt like I, I could do that. With that background, what's your vision for the role of the Biophysical Society next year? The role of the Biophysical Society, we have a strategic plan, um, is to advance biophysics, um, to um, bring young people into the field, uh, the brightest, smartest young people uh, to, um, to move biophysics forward because we think that uh, society needs uh, the answers that we can provide. What challenges then are there in recruiting underrepresented minorities and how are you going to ensure, if possible, that this happens? Well, I wouldn't say I could ensure it, but it's very difficult across all STEM fields. Um, underrepresented minorities um, and recruitment of underrepresented minorities is really the toughest problem we face. Um, and this is for all uh, societies, universities uh, across the board. And of course, I think the problem goes way beyond the societies. It starts young. I'm going to a workshop that's being uh, run by the American Institute of Physics in, next month um, and they're working on trying to find new methods to, to, to excite young people about science. I grew up in a really poor neighborhood in the south side of Chicago and none of my friends ever ever thought of going into science. It just never crosses anybody's mind and I think that's where we have to start um, is going to people where they are. If we, if we bring people to the society, and I've heard this over and over again, if they come to the meetings, they really get inspired by the science. And, and many of the other impediments and you know, the awkwardness that they may feel uh, gets overwhelmed by just how interesting things are and you know, what the possibilities are for doing the science. And so we end up uh, keeping them uh, once we get them here. Sounds like this could be a very exciting place to be for all walks of life then. Yes, and I wish that we could bring in more of the public um, to see biophysics. It's complicated, you know, and, and we need to learn how to talk to people about our science um, who are not scientists, right, and, and get them excited about how we do science as well. How could you sell it to them? Well, I think, you know, image is everything, <laughs> right? Um, and we have beautiful, beautiful images of life. I was just in a session about single molecules. You can see single little proteins doing their jobs, you know, individual proteins and um, tiny little things that, that are 10 to the minus uh, 9, you know, meters. <laughs> They're tiny, yeah. And we can see them and we can watch how, how they work individually. Um, and that gives us all sorts of clues about uh, things like I was saying, how cells know when they're big enough to divide. Um, just key questions in, in science and, and that have applications, many, many applications that we can't even imagine all of them uh, in, in health and in environment and, and many, many uh, fields where we, we certainly need help. Uh, Truly fascinating. Thank you so much. Incoming President Dr. Catherine Royer, thank you. Thank you. Sounds like 2021 will be another fantastic year for the Biophysical Society annual meeting. Before we get ahead of ourselves though, we've had a great time here in San Diego exploring everything from molecular motors to shape-shifting proteins. 
it's time to say goodbye. But remember, Biophysical Society TV lives online all year round. If you've missed anything or want to watch again, make sure to go online, press play, and hit the share button. Until next year, keep doing great work. We'll see you in 2021.